want to speak to you for just a few minutes tonight on just one simple word that God uh, kind of put laid on my heart, just the word vision, just the word vision. We're going to start here reading in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse number 1. If you found it, say amen. All right. It said, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, that his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere or before the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here am I. Also a very, very familiar scripture, if you'll turn with us real quick to the book of Proverbs. Amen. The book of Proverbs, chapter number 29. Just one verse of scripture here. It says, very familiar, you can probably all quote it. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. That word happy, when you read some commentary, isn't just happy and joyful, but it talks about being blessed, Sister Rayleigh. It talks about that he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And that, that word right there in the middle, that conjunction that says but, means a change. There's a change there in the message. It's an, the opposite of what was happening. It said, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Let's lift our hands, if you will, and just ask God to anoint us, to help us, and to speak through us tonight. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, I thank you. Let's get a vision. Just laying a little groundwork here for, uh, for what I want to talk to you about for just a few minutes. Man, I got to, I had had a couple of thoughts, and I told Ginger sometimes when I feel like something comes to my mind, or feel like the Lord's speaking to me, I start writing down a few things, and I almost can't write it down fast enough sometimes before I start losing some of it, and I don't want to miss anything, and so I wrote down some notes, uh, I think it was Thursday or Friday, and then yesterday I sit down at the table and begin to, to write a, a couple other things, and if I could have preached it right then, Brother Tim, you ever been working on a message, you wish you could preach it right then, didn't have to wait to another time because it was just burning and churning on the inside, and I said, Lord, if I could preach this right now, I think I'd be able to do it justice, but uh, maybe he was just talking to me at that time, Brother Rayleigh, and he was just trying to, to line me out, and now he wants to, uh, to speak to the rest of the church. But I'm thankful for this word of God tonight. I'm thankful for, uh, the, for the way that, uh, the, that this is written and how, how we're able to, to really catch a glimpse of the status of Israel at this point in time in history. This was a time before kings when judges ruled the land. And uh, if you read through the book of Judges about Deborah and, and Samson and many other famous judges uh, and how that God uh, used them to rule the people, there was no king. But Samuel was one of the first ones that he raised up to be a prophet to the nation of Israel. And when, when God raised Samuel up, he called him from a very young man. But he had, years before, God had established the priesthood, and we know all how all that goes. Man, you go back to the book of Exodus, and you can read about the priests, and you can read how God told them exactly how to build that tabernacle that, that was going to be moved around all over the wilderness, and how they were going to set up the holiest of holies, and how they were going to have the, the, the altar that was there, and they would have the candlestick, and all the lamps, and everything that was going to burn, and how the veil was to be made. God gave specific instructions for how all of this was to be done and when we read in the book of of first samuel chapter number three we were reading there about how eli was now the priest over israel and how that god had, had um placed eli in that position but eli had gotten to the place in his life he was a, he was an older man and and physically he could not see physically eli's vision was almost gone but even sadder than that probably was that spiritually the vision of Eli was also gone. For as far as seeing, the, seeing God move or seeing God's desire for the nation of Israel or, or seeing what God desired to do among the people, there was, the Bible says there was no open vision. 
for the people. And that vision should have came from Eli and spread throughout the people. And the Bible says that there in verse number, uh, verse number three, it says, and ere the lamp of God, uh, it says, and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. Or right before, before the lamp of God went out in the temple. Now, what was it that got it to the point? Was it just Eli that was the reason that that lamp was about to go out? If you'll turn with us real quickly to the book of uh, Exodus, chapter number 27. If you don't want to turn there, I can just read it to you. Exodus chapter 27 and verse number 20. Now, this in 26 and 27, God had spoke to Moses, and I'm just laying a foundation for just a minute, how that he was supposed to oversee all the building of this tabernacle. And he told him exactly how to make all those portions. And we could talk about the Ark of the Covenant and all those things. And, but he talked about this, this lampstand, this candlestick that was to, was to be placed inside that temple. And God told him that, that that lampstand was always to be burning, that it was never, ever to go out. And God told Moses, he said, make sure that it's built a certain way. He told him exactly how to build that lampstand, exactly to the smallest detail, exactly what it was supposed to look like, how, um, how it was supposed to be made and what it was supposed to be made of and how many uh, different uh, lampstands it was supposed to have and all these different things about it. But then God said to instruct the people, and if you look at Exodus chapter number 27 and verse number 20, he said, and thou shalt command the children of Israel, the people, that they bring thee pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. Now, what is he saying here? He has told the priest, he has told Moses that the priest is there and he's to take care of that temple. He's told Moses that that priest is supposed to be the one that will go in and offer the sacrifices. He's told Moses exactly how everything's supposed to be built. He said, but it is going to be the role of the people, the job of the people to bring the oil so that the lamp and never goes out within the temple, amen? Now we know that those burning lamps represented the presence of God in that temple. And it was a job of the people of Israel, the children of Israel, to make sure that they brought this olive oil that was beaten for the light that he talks about, to bring it to the priest so that the priest could make sure that there was always oil in that candlestick, in that lampstand, so that that fire would never, ever, ever go out. But now we see that we have come to a place where, where Samuel is a child and Eli is the priest over it. And the Bible said there is no open vision that the, the word of God was precious in those days, not meaning that they loved it I, really, but it just meant that it was, it was scarce. It was meant that it was not widespread. The voice of God wasn't heard like it once was. He said, and, and that there was no open vision within the land. And he said that before, ere just before the lamp went out in the temple that God calls unto Samuel. What caused that lamp to almost be about to go out with the temple? Somewhere at some point in time, e Eli had lost the vision that God had given to him. Somewhere along the way, Eli had lost the vision of what God desired to do among the people. There was no vision God speaking to the people anymore. The people had lost the desire for the things of God and the heart of God and they had turned their own ways and they no longer brought that oil that was required to keep the presence of God lit and burning within the temple. That thing that was to keep that candlestick lit, it had to come from the people. It was not to be made by the priest. It was not to be made by the sons of the priest, but it was to be made by the children of Israel, by the people that God had called and called to be his people. And church, I can tell you today that every single one of us are called upon by God to be that one that brings honor and praise and glory and worship. We are the ones that are called to be vessels that that all can be poured into so that when we come into the house of God, we can pour out of what God has placed in our lives and that the presence of God will inhabit the praises of his people. Moses oversaw all the making of all the things that were in that temple all the veil and how that candles. But when it came to the thing that kept the presence of the God, of God there, Moses, God said, Moses, it's not just your job, but it's your job along with every single one of the people of the children of Israel to do their part, to make sure that that, can, that light never goes out within the temple. It's every one of your job. So we fast forward to 1 Samuel chapter number three. Two things we see here that are missing. There is no vision and there is no oil. Eli had lost his vision. 
The people got no message. They were backslidden in their hearts, so they made no oil for the lamp. What was that vision? That vision was a supernatural revelation of God's will and God's purpose. That is what the people re received in order to meet their spiritual needs or to warn them. Back, back then, it was uh, the role of the priest or the prophet to make sure that that message of God was delivered, that it was to make sure that the vision of God was placed in the hearts of the people. But I want to read something to you real quick that changed in the New Testament after Jesus came and died. He said in, in the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 2, verse 5, he said, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You know what Peter is telling and writing to those Christians right there? He is saying that every single one of you are called to be priests unto the Lord. That every one of you are called to be a people that will make sacrifice unto God. Every single one of you now are responsible for the vision of God. Every single one of you now have a calling upon your life after Jesus has saved you, after he has saved you and washed away your sins. After you have accepted that, we are to offer, offer up spiritual sacrifices that we, the children of God, are called to be a holy priesthood. So now what is, it, what is this message saying to us? It's not just Eli anymore, but God is not just a priest anymore, but God is calling every man, every woman, every boy and every girl to catch a vision of what God desires to do among his people. He is calling for you and he's calling for me to not be blinded like Eli was and not to lose sight of the things that God desires to do, but he's calling out to a people and said the days and the last days he said I'll pour out my spirit he said and I want you to catch a vision of what I desire to do among the people revelation he calls us kings and priests he's called us to be priests the church world is losing the oil the presence of God because they have lost the vision which is the purpose and of the church let me repeat it. We are losing the oil, which is the presence of God, because we have lost the vision, which is the purpose of the church. And when we fail to see what God's purpose and God's calling and God's reason is to have the church of the living God, when we fail to get God's vision in our heart, when our eyes become dimmed or when they become scaled over and we can't see what God is calling for us to do, then we are only a few years removed from losing the presence of God because the, the, God has called us to be a holy people. He's called us to be a peculiar people. He said, I've called you to be vessels. I've called you to be a workman. I've called you to be kings and priests. And when we lose sight of what God has called us to do, he said, my presence will not dwell in an unclean temple. My spirit's not going to dwell there where it's not wanted or where it's not appreciated or where it's not desired and when we lose sight of what God's calling is for our life then we are shortly not very far away from losing the presence of God in our life as well Proverbs said where there is no vision the people perish we have people sitting on church pews all over America all over the world who are perishing the word of God said, my people perish for what? The lack of knowledge. Amos said there will, in the last days there will come a famine, not of bread, not of meat, but of the hearing of the word of God. You know what's happened to the church? We're not hearing the word of God. Oh, it's preached. Oh, it's available. It's out there. You ever, you ever been around your kids and you know they're listening to you, but they're not hearing you? They, they hear what you're saying, but it's not getting from, from their ear and to their, to their brain. It's not but about that far, but it's not quite making it. And a lot of times God is talking to the church, and God is calling the church, and God is directing the church, and we hear what God is saying, but it's never making it from, making it from our ear to our heart. It's never making it from our hearing to, 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 to the point where it'll change the way that we live our life and make us desire and want to see and catch a glimpse of the vision of God vision Eli had lost his vision as a result the people had lost their desire for the presence of God to make that oil and it was almost to the point where the lamp of God was about to go out 
in the temple. Vision is defined in a couple of ways. The ability to see those things which are visible. We need that. We need to be able to see those things which are visible. We need to be able to look and see the things that are going on around us as they are. We need to be the ability to be honest with ourselves about the condition of our life or the condition of the church world. We need to be able to look and take inventory of our life. We talked a little bit about this in Sunday school this morning, how, how it, what the Bible talks about a man that goes to a mirror and sees his reflection and sees what's wrong with himself, but then he walks away from that mirror and forgets what manner of man that he was. So many times we hear the word of God preached and we hear what God says or we feel that conviction in our life or we read the word of God and God starts talking to you, I want you to change, I want you to do something, but as soon as we get up from the word of God or walk out of the house of God we forget about that message that God laid upon our heart or that burden that God has called and gee, God said don't be that kind of person but remember what I've said to you remember the kind of man that I've shown you that you are and then repent and turn back to me and walk away from those things which I desire you to leave and I'll show you my vision but too many Christians walk around in a daze or in a haze the Bible says in one part that they're ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning. Boy, we live in an age when everything's available. We can hear and read and, and we, can, we can try to learn different things, but we never really come to the knowledge of the truth of the Word of God. Well, how can you say that, Brother Scotty? Because when we come to that truth of the knowledge of the Word of God in our life, Sister Sessions, it begins to change the way that I live my life. It begins to, when I come to that, when that knowledge is revealed to my heart and to my life, it is impossible unless I completely reject the Word of God to allow that knowledge to penetrate my heart and to get in there where it should be and not respond in some manner. We either decide that we're not going to live the way God wants to or we decide that we're going to follow the way that God wants to. But it's not going to, to, going to allow us to live in a lukewarm state where we continue to just ride the church pews in and out and where we're, we come in cold and we leave maybe a little bit warm but God said that I'd rather you be hot or cold because if you're lukewarm you make me sick to my stomach I'd rather you be one or be the other be in or be out be sold out or just give up than to be lukewarm because I'll spew you out of my mouth we need the ability to have vision to see what's really going on in our lives we need the ability, God give us, you know what that is? That is being able to feel conviction to God, of God, the conviction of the Holy Ghost, and to be able to understand what God is speaking to our hearts and say, yes, Lord, that's me. Old song says, not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And God wants us to have the vision to be able to see exactly the things that are going on around us. Don't be blinded. But it also means, the word vision not only means the ability to see things that are visible, but the word vision also means a manifestation to the senses of something that was, is immaterial. Made of conceiving or seeing a concept unusual discernment and foresight church if we have ever lived in a day when spiritual discernment is lacking i believe it's in the day and hour that we're living in why does every man seem to do that which is right in his own eyes because there is no spiritual discernment anymore the people aren't hearing from god the, the, the Bible says that, if I, if I can see if I can find, I think it's second, 1 Corinthians. Let me read this verse to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 12. It says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Who's he talking to? Us. We who have received the Spirit of God. He said, We have received the Spirit of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost 
teacheth. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Listen to this. For the, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The Bible tells us in another part that the Spirit searches the deep things of God. And church, if there has ever been a day when we need men and women, boys and girls, to be full of the Holy Ghost, to be full of the Spirit of God, it's in the day and hour that we are living in right now. In 2019, if we are to catch the vision of God, if we are to able to see the things that God desires for my life and for your life and for our church, then we must be able to be spiritually, they will be spiritually discerned. And the Word of God tells us the only way that will happen is when I I am full of the presence of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost is living and abiding and working in my heart and changing my mind and changing my life and working in me every single day. But being full of the Spirit of God is not just feeling it when the music gets right or when the preaching is good or when the testimonies is good or when somebody's, that's not being full of the Spirit of God. You know what that's like? You ever... You ever went, Sister Ruthie and Sister Melania went to food shows. You know what I'm talking about? They, they'll have, or any, how many of y'all ever go to Sam's? Sam's Hole says Sam's Club. And they got those little places set up, and you go over and you try a piece of the, the food or whatever they got cooked just to give you a taste. They're trying to get you to buy some of it. Well, if you go in there hungry, you might make two or three laps around that same one, or you might go hit them all two or three times. And you go in, you, you eat a little bit, and you grab a toothpick here, and you eat that one, and before you leave out, you got a pocket full of toothpicks. But you've been, just been nibbling, you've been grazing, going from place to place. That's kind of how it is when we get in that kind of service and we just feel the Spirit of God moving. Boy, I can feel it a little bit over here. And when the song gets right over here, boy, I feel a little bit of it right there. And, and boy, when Brother Tim's preaching and laying, he gets all excited, I can feel a little bit right there and I'm getting a little bit from that stand. But we're never really full of the Spirit of God because when we're full of the Spirit of God, we won't just taste it and we won't enjoy it, but it's going to begin to flow out of our belly. He said, out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. And that spirit will rise up within you. It'll be something that you can't contain. And you won't just enjoy somebody else's worship, but you'll get lost in worship yourself. And you'll get lost in the vision of God yourself. And that Holy Ghost will begin to flow out of your mouth. And that spirit of God will begin to flow through your body. And it'll catch on to somebody else. There's a difference between getting a taste and being full. And in order for us to get this spiritual discernment, this vision, this unusual discernment and foresight, we must be full of the Spirit of God. There is no other way to see the vision of God and to press and to follow after that. God makes us spiritual. Lord, help us to get this natural man, the flesh, out of the way enough so that we can spiritually discern your vision for our life and for our church. You know, the place that we're in so many times, and I'm not pointing fingers, I'm just telling you I believe that this is really where we live, is that so many times I'm struggling just to maintain I'm struggling to maintain the status quo, to keep things the way that they are. I'm struggling enough just to maintain faithfulness or just to hold on till God comes back. I'm struggling just to make it to church and have a praise in my heart on a Sunday night that I'm never really full to the point where I can go above and beyond and catch that spiritual vision and see what God's desire is that I'm either happy with or barely maintaining the place where I'm at. Amen? But he said you're going to be more than conquerors. That you're made overcomers. You're not made survivors. Overcomers. Overcomers. You're that you're more than enough. 
that, that he that is in you is greater, not equal to, or not, not going to just be, but he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And that spirit that is living and abiding within you should push us and press us and move us to the place that we are not happy with the status quo, that we're not happy with where we are. But God, I want to be full and I want to have vision and I want to be able to see what you're desiring to do and where I'm at and where you want me to be. Help me to discern your vision for the church. So we examine our vision and we look at it. We get them to check it out. We see if our vision is adequate. A lot of Christians have, their vision is just too general. We talked about in Sunday school, and I've talked to the young people about it, about the big three. What's the big three you got to do? Read your Bible, pray, and go to church. You do those three, you're all right. You made it. You survived. You can make it to heaven, maybe. But we talked this morning about how Peter told them to add to their faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience. And he goes on and tells them to grow in grace and how that Paul talked about how that they need to be spiritually strong and how they need to be men when it comes to the things of God. But too many of us are too general when it comes to our vision. What's your vision? Well, I want to go to heaven. Well, amen. That's the vision of all people. What's your vision? I want to serve the Lord faithfully. Amen, that's great. You can serve the Lord. My vision is to do the work of evangelism. That's wonderful. That's great. God's calling us to do that. But church, that's just the baseline. That's just the things that God told us to do. That's just, that's the things that everybody's required to do. Everybody's required to be an evangelist. Everybody's required to serve God faithfully. Everybody should want to go to want to go to heaven. Amen. That's the things that everybody. But what is God's vision for you? What is God desiring for you to do that maybe is different from somebody else? What is it that God is calling you for that he's not calling that brother or sister that may be next to you? What is it that God's desire is with the will of God for your life that would move you and make you push, push yourself out of your comfort zone to get out of your Jerusalem, push you into your Samaria, to take you out of that place where you've always been into something, something deeper in God, to take you out of that place where you are right now to the next level in God. But that takes... Extra work and extra effort. There's more. Sometimes we're just too general. Sometimes we're too limited. We fail to think specifically about the Lord's work. Think about that. We fail to set our sights high enough for God's work. Church, you know what? I'm a, I work in operations out at the refinery. That's my job, but that's not who I am. That's not what God called me to do, all right? Brother John works in insurance. It takes a lot of his time. It's a necessary evil. <laughs> Got to pay bills, right? That's what he does. That's not necessarily what God called him to do. He didn't create you and put you on this earth, Brother Jason, just so that you could build ships. He didn't create you and put you on this earth, Sister Rita, just so that you could keep the books for the church. God didn't create you and put you on in Forest Lake Assembly of God, Brother Mark, so that you could build houses. Those are things that we do, but that's not who we are. And so many times my life, our lives gets consumed around those things. I get consumed with the things that are necessary, but not my calling. I got to go to work and provide for my family, Brother Wayne, but that's not my calling. And wherever God places me, Brother Tim, whether it's out there or whether it's in here or whether it's out shopping somewhere or wherever it might be, I can never misplace and lose the vision of what God has called me to do. See, your vision will keep you on track when you're in the midst of a bunch of sinners. 
Your calling can keep you on track when you're going through a bad day, Sister Rayleigh. When we make our calling and our election sure, when we catch that vision of God, Brother Cauley, when we know that God is calling us to deeper depths and higher heights, when we know that there's more to God than this shallow experience, and we realize that God is calling us right now, this year, at this time, he, oh, Esther was called into the, to the house of God, and Mordecai called and told her, he said, Esther, he said, who knows if God has not put you here for such a time as this? What he was telling her is, Esther, God has placed you there to be the queen over all these people, but that is not your calling. God has called you to be a woman of God in the place where you are at because he's going to bring deliverance to the people and wherever you may be God may have placed you in that area but his calling upon your life is to catch the vision of God so that we can provide the oil for the lamp and the presence of God to whatever place God puts us I got to have that vision in my life but we're too limited with limited vision we get content with just keeping house for the Lord. We are content to just hold the fort. We're content to just hang in there, to just tie a knot in the rope where we are and just hang on till the Lord comes back and gets us. When this is our attitude, little is done and less is accomplished. Limited vision is coated, is painted with nostalgia a lot of times. You know what that is? It's reminiscing and wanting to go back. Wanting to, and we've got to be careful about this even as people of God. That we can't get so lost in saying, well, God, it's just not like it used to be. It's not what it once was. That we lose vision of where we are now and what God is calling us to do in this present day. Because when you look and you read in the book of, I think it's in the book of uh, Ezra. And then in the book of Haggai as well, when God, is, God calls for the rebuilding of the temple or the tabernacle, the Bible said that God stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and stirred up the spirit of Joshua and stirred up the remnant of the hearts of the people. I want to flip over there real quick and read this to you. When God said that Ezra, I remember Brother Tim preached a message on this one time before that when the people saw the temple after it was built, that some of them wept and some of them cried. Some of them remember the, the one before. But you know, listen to what God says in the book of it's, uh, Haggai chapter number 1. Let me see if I can find it here quickly. Chapter number 1, and we'll read verse number 14. It said, The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of the, all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So what happened there? The Bible says that the Lord stirred up their spirit. He gave them a vision, if you will, of what he desired to do. And then the people, along with Zerubbabel and Joshua, came to work in the house of God. Chapter number 2, verse 2 says, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, to the residue of the people, said, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So the people looked and they said, This sitting not the way it used to be. This is not as good as what the temple once was. This is not as good as how it was before it was destroyed. But look what God is telling to them. Let's go down. He said, verse number 7, he said, And I will shake all the nations, and the desire of all the nations shall come. And I will fill this house with the glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And this place will I give peace, saith the the Lord of hosts. You know what God is telling them? He said, don't look back and weep over how beautiful the old temple was. It doesn't matter. God said, I'm able to come forth and to do a new thing and I'm able to bring my presence into this new house. I'm able to stir up among this generation, among this group of people. I'm able to touch in hearts and lives today and what I'm able to do if you'll just get the vision of the house of God. Our vision. If we look over in the 
book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse number 17. Very, very familiar scripture. Amen. Can you pull that one up, Brother Barry? Acts 2 and 17. We know these, this scripture by heart. You most of you could probably quote it. When Peter came and he stood up in the midst of the people, after the day of Pentecost, the people were looking and they were saying, man, what, what's going on here? What does all this mean? What, what does it mean? He said, and it shall come to pass, Peter said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. Where are we living at, Brother Wayne? Last days. He said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He said, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. He said, your young men shall what? See visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. You know what that's telling me? That when the Spirit of God comes, when the, in these last days that we're living in, when the Spirit of God comes and He begins to pour out upon all flesh, you're not going to have to look back and say, this is, it was so good back in those days, but you're going to be able to look and say, God is moving in the midst of our congregation right now. God's moving in the midst of the people right now, and there's some young men with some visions, there's some old men with some dreams, and the Spirit of God is calling upon people everywhere to catch a hold of what God is desiring to do so that it stirs us from the place that we are at. I want to close here in just a second. Just a couple of things here. Our vision needs faith. Hebrews 11 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's not visible to the eye, but I've got a vision of what God desires to do. If we have faith in the power of the gospel, faith in the healing of God, faith that God can save anybody, move among anybody, heal anybody, our faith will push our vision. And then our vision must have action. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind me. He said, I press toward the mark of the high calling. You know what Paul was saying? He said, I've got a vision, the call of God and what God desires of me. There, I've got a goal up there. I've got a mark of what God desires for my life. He said, and I'm pressing toward that mark. That faith will cause us to go into action. It'll cause us, our faith will, our, it will cause us to put our vision into action. The Bible said that faith without works is what? dead. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 13 said all these died in the faith having not received the promises but having seen them afar off. Those men and women of God were a people with vision. Those men and women of God didn't know the fulfillment of what God desires to do. Church we don't know the fulfillment of what God desires to do with us. You don't know yet what God is going to do in your life. But we've got to have a vision that, God, there's more than this. There's more to it than this right here. There's more to it than me just coming in on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday, feeling a little moved. But there's a world out there that I need to take your vision to. God, stir up something within us. Stand with me, if you will. Stir up something within us. Give us that vision. Give us that vision. James chapter 2 said, excuse me, <coughs> James chapter 2 said, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thy faith, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. God is calling for the church of the living God to step out of our comfort zone to go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. God's calling for you and for me this year, I believe, to move past where we are and say, God, what is your vision for my life? We talked this morning, and Sister Jerry Lynn brought out a, a very good point. She talked about, I hope she don't, I don't think she'll mind me sharing this, how that 
Grant said they were around some kids or something, and Grant, uh, the kids were kind of acting up a little bit. And Grant said, Mom, I'm glad you didn't let me act like that or that I don't act like that anymore or something like that. And she told, uh, told about a teaching experience, Brother Cawley, where he used to act like that. <laughs> but she had to learn, he had to learn some correction, learn some self-control. And now he looks back and he said, thank God I'm not like that anymore. Now he's up here singing and helping, helping all these young men worship the Lord, lead us in worship. But church, if you look back in your life, a year ago, two years ago, can you look back, Brother Mark, and say, thank God I'm not like that anymore? Not, I'm not talking about before you were saved. I'm talking about since you've been saved. Since God has brought you out of the sinful condition, washed you clean, maybe filled you with the Holy Ghost. Can you look at back at your life from then and say, God, I'm closer to you now than I was last year. God, I got more of your vision now than I did last year on January the 20th. God, I'm following after your calling. God, I'm pursuing that high mark. God, I'm chasing after you harder. God, I'm more thirsty for you now. God, I'm hungrier for you now. God, I see that you're wanting to do something in my life, and I'm actively working in faith, believing that you're going to do that in my life. Are we actively pursuing the vision of God? Or have we become passive and say, God, stir me if you can. Save them if you want to. Fill me if you think I'm worthy. But if not, as long as I make it to heaven, I'll be all right. Church, I can promise you that's not God's vision for any of us, for the church of God. Don't become like Eli. Don't be there in the house of God, but lost his vision. Don't be like the people who lost the vision of God and failed to bring the oil to keep the presence of God. But God, give us a hunger for your vision. God, let me see what you desire for my life and for our church. Let me desire to have the presence of God moving and stirring and flowing. And let me desire it so much that it stirs me to move from my complacent place where I am and stir me when I'm at home to call out to you in prayer. My, cause it for, to cause me to hunger and thirst after the word of God so that I can get in there and you can begin to change me in my closet or change me in my room or change me at the table. Don't let me wait until Brother Tim preaches it to me for God to stir my heart. But Lord, wherever I'm at, begin to speak to me and move me at times if that's your heart's desire tonight I want you to just simply come around these altars let's take a knee get on our knees before God and say God in this year more than ever before I desire your vision I want to see what you want to do in my life and in my church and in my family let's call upon him and get serious about catching the vision of God tonight <laughs>